On the 25th of May in the morning, you have physics paper one. This is one hour, 45 minutes long. There are a hundred marks available in the paper and there are these topics that you need to be familiar with. Now this video is very much to help you revise. It's gonna summarize everything that you've already learned in lessons, but if you want to find out even more to give yourself the best chance of achieving your highest grade, you can find detailed videos over at GCSE Physics Online. There are over 500 videos where I can teach you any part of the course that you're not confident with. There are also worked examples and even videos where I cover all of the practicals that you should be familiar with. Now, the other thing you need to use as you're using this video is this AQA GCSE Physics Revision Guide. It's completely free to download and there's a link underneath the video for you to do that. Inside it, I have these learning checklists and you can complete those as you're doing your revision. There's also information including things like the definitions that you need to be aware of, all the circuit symbols, as well as advice on how to revise. So you can get that guide, you can download it, and then you can use it as you're looking through this video. So here we go with topic number one. Now energy is a bit like money and it can be stored in different places or maybe transferred from one store to the other. And we can also think of it a bit like a liquid that's maybe transferred from different store to different store. Now there are a number of different stores that we need to consider. So we have kinetic energy, which is due to how quickly things are moving. We've got elastic potential, if you maybe deform an object, like you squash it or squeeze it. Gravitational potential is to do with how high you move something. And then we've got thermal, which is the internal energy store, as well as a few others. Now what we can do is, with energy, we can actually work things out. And uh, if we wanted to work out the kinetic energy, for example, uh, the kinetic energy is equal to a half mv squared where the V here stands for the speed of the object, and that's measured in meters per second. We should always measure our mass in kilograms, and then this means that the unit for energy is the joule. This energy is equal to a half Ke squared, where E is the extension of that object, not how long it is completely, but how much longer it has become. And again, what we do, we measure our extension in meters, K is the spring stiffness, and this is measured in newtons per meter. And once again, we measure our energy in joules. Our gravitational potential energy, EP, is equal to mgh. So here again, we have our energy in joules, our mass in kilograms. H is the height that something's moved through in meters. And G is what we call the gravitational field strength. And on Earth, this has a value of 9.8 newtons per kilogram, but this does depend on where you are uh, in the universe. Some things like the moon, for example, have a much smaller value of their gravitational field strength. When it comes to looking at thermal energy, what we can do is we can change the thermal energy of something uh, by looking at mc delta theta. So here what we have is our theta, that's our temperature, and that's measured in degrees Celsius. We measure our mass in kilograms, and this thing down here, little c, is our specific heat capacity. And this is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one kilogram of something, of the substance, by one degree Celsius. So that means the unit for this uh, are joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. So we have these different stores of energy, but what we can now consider is the different ways that energy is transferred from one store to the other. And there are four main transfers that we need to think about. So these are our four transfer processes. You've got heating, electrical working, radiation, and this could be things like sound waves, or it could be light waves, and also the rest of the parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And finally, we have mechanical. Now, it's really important to look at the way that energy is transferred from one store to the other. And what we might consider is at the start of a process, we can maybe consider the energy store. We then need to define a clear end point and we can consider how the energy is stored at this point. And what we can then do is think about the transfer as well. So these are some of the things we need to think about. If you've got an object projected upwards, maybe it starts um, as the kinetic energy store and ends up uh, transferred to the gravitational potential store. If you've got a moving object hitting an obstacle, it might end up going from the kinetic store, uh, radiated by sound perhaps, into the thermal store of the surroundings. If you've got something which is accelerating, 
um, depending on what provides this force, you might then increase the, the kinetic energy store. You've got to be familiar with all of these and get used to doing different problems where you might have different energy stores. And that just comes with practice. It's also worth considering how quickly that tra transfer takes place. And what we can then think about is the idea of power. So power is defined as the rate at which energy is transferred or at which work is done. Now we can say that power is equal to the energy transferred divided by time and the word rate just means the amount per second or we can also look at power as the work done per unit time and we always measure energy and work done in joules. If we measure time in seconds this then gives us a power measured in the watt. Now when we think about an energy transfer process although some of the energy might be transferred to a useful store at the end some of the energy might also be wasted. Perhaps it's going to heat up the surroundings. And what we can then think about is something called efficiency. And efficiency is often given a number between 0 and 1, or between 0 and 100%. And we can work out the efficiency by looking at the useful output energy transfer divided by the total input energy transfer. Effectively, the more energy that's transferred usefully, the higher the efficiency. And we can do the same thing where we're maybe not thinking about the energy transfer, but the power. And we can look at the useful power output compared to the useful, the total power input. And finally, we can think about energy resources. And what we're talking here is about things that are maybe used for transport. For example, uh, cars. We might think about electrical or electricity generation. And finally, we can also use these for heating our homes and businesses. What we then need to do is think about maybe different ways in which we can generate electricity. There are two main categories. We've got non-renewable and renewable. Non-renewable resources, once they're used up, we can't replenish them. So we're thinking about coal, oil and gas, as well as nuclear fuels. And when we talk about nuclear fuel, we're often thinking about uranium or plutonium. When it comes to renewable energy resources, so we have biofuel which can be burnt and the reason that we burn all of these or use this to generate heat is to boil water. Water turns a turbine which then turns a generator which generates electricity. Uh, one way we can get away with not burning things is to use wind turbines where it's the power of the wind directly which is causing the generator in the top of this to turn. We can use solar cells which uh, turn that sunlight into electricity. We also have geothermal, hydro, wave and tidal, where these are just different ways of having moving water hitting a turbine blade to cause a generator to turn. So that is energy for AQA. So this video is a summary of the AQA electricity topic. And what we have in electrical circuits are a load of small electrical components. And what we need to do is we need to draw out circuits and to help us with this, we have some circuit symbols. So some of these might be common from before, but there's a few extra ones, things like light dependent resistors, diodes, and so on, that it's worth just spending the time memorizing what all of these stand for. And the reason for this is it allows us to draw circuits really simply. Now, in the simplest case, we might have a power supply, so a cell. Uh, we might have an ammeter, and you always put the ammeter in series. Uh, and this is connected to maybe a lamp. And when the circuit is connected, it starts shining. We can also use a voltmeter to measure the potential difference across a component. So it's always worth remembering that ammeters go in series and voltmeters go in parallel. So what we have here is our really, really simple circuit. Now for this one here, uh, what we can think about is the rate of flow of charged particles around the circuit. That's what tra is transferring the energy from the cell, in this case, to the lamp. And we've got to remember that electric current is the rate of flow of electric charge. Now, one of the equations we can use is that Q is equal to I times T. Now, somewhat confusingly, uh, we use Q as a symbol for charge, and charge is measured in coulombs. We use I for the current. This is like the intensity of current. And we measure the current in the unit of the amp. And then time we measure in seconds. And really what electric current is, is a flow of electric charge. And in a circuit like this, where we have maybe a DC supply, so it's a direct current, we've got the flow of electrons in the wires. Now we can also think of this electric current, which is going through a component. It depends upon the potential difference across it, V, 
and also the resistance of that component. Effectively, we're going to have a bigger current flowing if you've got a bigger potential difference, but if you have a bigger resistance, that reduces the current. And what we have here is V stands for our potential difference, and this is measured in volts. R is the resistance measured in ohms, and then once again, the current is measured in amps. Sometimes a more useful equation is V equals I times R, and you can apply this to any part of the circuit. If you know the potential difference and the resistance, you can then work out the current that is flowing. But when it comes to resistance, we need to look at the resistance of certain components. And we can set up a simple circuit a bit like this. And what we have is a power supply, we have a variable resistor, and this, allows, this then allows us to change the current and the potential difference across a component. And we can do this for the following things. And we need to look at the characteristics of resistors, lamps, and diodes. Now, if we have a resistor, what we find is when we plot uh, values of current and potential difference, we get a straight line that goes through the origin. And what this means is that as you have a greater potential difference, you've got a greater current that flows, and that's because the resistance is constant. In actual fact, this is a great example of something called an ohmic conductor. And provided this stays at the same temperature, the current is going to be proportional to the potential difference. If, however, you have a filament lamp, this isn't an ohmic conductor, and what we find is we get a graph that looks a bit like this. What that means is, as this gets hotter and hotter and gives out more light, the resistance increases. So this one here, you've got a changing resistance for this light bulb. If you have a diode, on the other hand, the whole point in a diode is it works a bit like a one-way valve and it only lets the current flow in one direction, so we get a graph like this. Effectively, if you've got a negative potential difference, the value of current is zero, but when you have a high potential difference, loads of current can flow through, and this really allows us to control the way that uh, current flows in a circuit. Now there are two other components that we can investigate. Uh, one of them is a light dependent resistor. And if we look at the resistance and the amount of light intensity, with an LDR, when we increase the light intensity, the resistance decreases. And the same kind of thing happens when we have a thermistor. So a thermistor is a thermal resistor. Once again, if we have the resistance on this axis of the graph and we look at the temperature on this axis, as we heat this up, the resistance goes down. And these two components can be used for all sorts of applications where maybe these can be used to sense something. So if it gets too hot or gets too dark, we can use this to turn on other parts of an electrical circuit. Now there are two main categories of circuits. We've got series circuits and parallel circuits. In a series circuit, we have one thing after another. In a parallel, we have separate loops and there's different ways for the electricity to flow. Now in a series circuit, if we were to look at the value of the current down here in this part of the circuit, we'd find that it's the same value as the current here and the same value as the current up there. So in a series circuit, what happens is that I1 is equal to I2, which equals I3. We have the same current around the whole circuit. In a parallel circuit, if we were to look at I1, which is flowing down here, and we looked at I2, and we looked at I3, so that's the current through each resistor, what we find is that the current splits at this junction, and what we find here is that I1 is equal to I2 plus I3. So in a parallel circuit, we have a different current in each part of the loop. But if we were to look at the potential difference, say we had a potential difference of V1 across the cell, and we compared that to V2 and V3, that's the potential difference across these two resistors, what we find is that this potential difference is split between the components. So V1 is equal to V2 plus V3. In this circuit, however, if we've got V1 here, V2 and V3, we find that the potential difference across each loop of this parallel circuit is the same. So here we find that V1 is equal to V2, which is equal to V3. So potential difference around any loop in a parallel circuit is going to be the same. Now when it comes to looking at resistance, if we have resistor R1 and R2, in a series circuit their total resistance is going to be equal to R1 plus R2. Effectively the more resistors we have in the circuit, the bigger the total resistance. But in a parallel circuit, if we had R1 and R2 now in parallel, there's effectively more ways for the current to flow. So the more resistors you have here, 
the lower their total combined resistance. Now you don't need to calculate it, but you need to know that the total resistance is going to be less than the value of R1, and also that total resistance is going to be less than the value of R2. So now we know a bit more about uh, the way that current and potential difference um, occur in series and parallel circuits. We know we've got some of the other equations. We can also look at the electrical power. So this is the amount of energy transferred per second. And what we can say is that the power is equal to the potential difference times the current. Now again, we measure our potential difference, V, in volts, our current in amps, and we measure our power in watts. That's the amount of joules per second that are transferred. So effectively, if you've got a component with a bigger current flowing through it and a bigger potential difference, it's going to transfer more energy per second. But sometimes we might not know the potential difference. And the other equation we can use is P is equal to I squared R. So we can also work out the power, capital P, as equal to the current squared times the resistance. Now, again, you've got to remember that energy is going to be equal to power times time. And another way of looking at the energy transferred is equal to QV. So this is Q, which is a charge in coulombs, potential difference in volts, and this then gives our energy transferred in joules. So there's a whole load of different equations that you need to be familiar with that you can then apply to circuits. Now, so far, we've been looking at direct current, which flows one way around the circuit. But then the, there's another type of circuit which uses alternating current. This is the kind of thing that you might have in a household appliance where you plug something into the mains. And the UK mains is 230 volts, and it's got a frequency, which is, means there's 50 cycles per second. If we were to look at this on a graph, this means that sometimes you've got a positive value and sometimes it's negative. And this means that the current flows one way, then the other, then the other, way, then the other, then the other, then the other, really, really quickly. Now, um, this is used in normal kind of household appliances. And what we often have is this three core cable. So we have three different wires in the core of that cable. So the brown wire provides the alternating potential difference from the supply. The neutral wire completes the circuit, and it's the difference between the potential difference here that causes uh, effectively that current to flow. And then finally, you've got this green and yellow wire, which is called the earth wire. And this is a safety wire that means if there's a fault in the system, this carries this, the, any electricity back to the earth rather than going through your body, as it says over here. So you need to remember some of these facts about an alternating supply, especially the household supply that we have in the UK. Now the other thing that means that AC is really useful is it allows us, allows us to transfer energy over large distances or transfer electricity over large distances by using the national grid. Now, where can I put this? Just down here. So the national grid is a system of cables and transformers that link power stations to consumers. And what you have in a transformer is you have two coils of wire, the primary and the secondary, and these are wrapped around an iron core. Now, when you have an alternating supply in one, it causes there to be an alternating supply in the other. And this allows us to massively increase the potential difference, but also decrease the current. And this reduces energy losses in our power supply. So you need to know a bit about the national grid and how we have step-up transformers, which increase the voltage, or we also have step-down transformers, which decrease the voltage. And finally, we have static electricity. Now this is often caused if you have an insulator and maybe you rub it against another insulator. What happens then is that some of the electrons are transferred from one to the other. So that means if some electrons are transferred from this to this by the rubbing action, this thing becomes more negative, while this thing here now has an overall positive charge. And if you then separate these two things, these two things are going to have a force acting on each other. So in this case, there's going to be an attractive force, but if they had the same charge, they'd then be repulsive. And if we had maybe a charged sphere, and maybe this one had a positive charge, we can look at the region around it. And in the region around it where other charged objects experience the force, we say that this is an electric field. And if we were to draw the field lines around this positive charge here, they'd all be pointing away from it. Effectively, that's the direction that if you had a positive charge and you put it here, which way would it move? Well, this would be repelled. And what we find is that the electric charge is stronger near the surface. So that's it. That's AQA electricity. We've got different circuit components and how they work. 
in both series and parallel circuits, loads of equations as well as information that you need to understand about an alternating supply. So this video is revision of the particle model, which is something that we use in physics to explain the world around us. Now the first thing we're going to consider is something called density. Now density is basically a measure of how much stuff there is in a given volume. So perhaps we have uh, two things which have the same volume. Uh, so I'm just going to take this off. What we have is the same volume uh, of material here, but this one here is a lot heavier, it's got a bigger mass. And that means that there's effectively more stuff in the same space. Now the way that we work out density, uh, we use the symbol rho, so R H O. Uh, this is a Greek letter that we use to represent density, and it's equal to the mass divided by the volume. Now because we always measure mass in kilograms, and we tend to measure volume in cubic meters, this then gives our density in kilograms per cubic meter. Although sometimes if we were to measure our mass in grams or volume in cubic centimeters, we could also, uh, depending what we're measuring our quantities in, we could maybe look at the grams per cubic centimeter. Now this particle model allows us to look at solids, liquids, and gases. And if we think about the behavior of the individual particles or molecules, this explains why certain things have certain properties. So I'm just gonna consider solids, liquids, and gases. So in a solid, we have this close packed regular arrangement of particles. Now they're still uh, jiggling around, they're still vibrating, but they're not really able to move around that uh, material. So that's why a solid is what it is. A liquid, on the other hand, um, the, the, the particles are still really densely packed together, probably a similar density to in a solid, but here they're able to move past each other. And what we have is this random motion of all the particles in a liquid. In a gas, on the other hand, the particles are really spread quite a long way away. They're moving quickly in all random directions. And because of this, we can do things like we can compress a gas or, or whatever. So let's think about how we go from one state to another. Now, if you have a solid and you heat it up, it turns into a liquid, so that's when it's melting. The liquid then might boil and turn into a gas. But if we have something which is evaporating, this is where something turns from a liquid to a gas below its boiling temperature. This is the reason uh, that things like puddles do dry up, even though it never gets to above 100 degrees. That water still turns into the water vapour. Going the other way, we have gas that condenses to a liquid, and then the liquid freezes to a solid. But what we also have sometimes is a solid that turns directly into a gas. You might have seen this with some carbon dioxide pellets. And this is what we call subliming. And the key thing to remember is when we move from one state to another, there's no chemical reactions happening. It's just a physical change, which means it can be reversed and they can go back to the state they were in before. Now, I said that all of these particles may be moving around and so on. And what we can then consider is something's internal energy. Now, internal energy is defined as the total kinetic and potential energies of all the particles that make up that system. So this is a combination of their potential energy, which is due to the arrangement of the particles, as well as how quickly they're vibrating and moving around. Now, if we were to look at the internal energy, so this is what this E stands for here, and we look at how that compares to the temperature, what we find is that as you increase the internal energy, the temperature also increases until we get to this point where we have a change of state. And what we find is that when something changes state, so maybe it's, in this case, the temperature is increasing, so it might be melting, it might be boiling, we have that happening at a constant temperature. Now, what we can think about are the amount, or is the amount of energy that uh, it needs to go from one temperature to another. And what we have here, when we have these regions here, we have something which is maybe a gas, a liquid or a solid. If we want to look at the amount of energy that it takes to heat something up, we can then look at something called the specific heat capacity. So the link between the internal energy and the temperature is that the change in internal energy is equal to mc delta theta, where what we have is our change in energy in joules, we've got our change in temperature, that's all the delta means, a change in, in degrees Celsius, we have our mass in kilograms, and this thing here, C, is our specific heat capacity, and that's measured in joules per kilogram per degree. But what happens when something is changing state? Here, the temperature doesn't change, and there, we need to think about something called the specific latent heat.
And this is then defined as the amount of energy required to change the state of one kilogram of the substance with no change in temperature. So this is where we're looking at this region on the graph, or this one up here. And the equation that we can use for this is that E is equal to ML. Once again, we measure our energy in joules, our mass in kilograms, and that means the units for this latent heat, the specific latent heat, are equal to the amount of joules per kilogram. Now imagine this is a container that has some gas molecules in it, and what these are doing is these are moving in all directions at a range of different speeds. So that's the kind of random motion that we get in a gas. Now provided we kept it at a constant volume and then we increase the temperature, as you increase the temperature we're going to give these things more kinetic energy remembering that the internal energy is related to the kinetic and potential energies of these uh, particles in here. Now what that means is that if you were to increase the temperature, then what would happen is that these things would have uh, an increased store of kinetic energy, and that means that they'd be moving quicker. Uh, so their velocity or their speed also increases. And that means when they hit the side of the container, they'd be hitting it with a greater force because they're moving quicker. And what that means then is that the pressure of this gas would increase. So you have some gas, it's at a constant volume and you heat it up and the pressure then increases. But if we had the same amount of gas and we put it into a larger container, what we're doing there is we are increasing the volume. So let's take this gas and put it in here. Now these are still going to be moving around, but they're going to be hitting the edge of the container less frequently. And also, the size of the area of that uh, outside of the container is going to increase as well. Now what this means is that there's going to be less collisions per second, and that means that the force that they exert on the side is going to be not only smaller, but it means the pressure is going to decrease as well. So when you increase the volume for that same amount of gas at a constant temperature, it means that the pressure goes down. What we can actually say is that the pressure is inversely proportional to the volume, or we could write that as pressure times the volume is equal to a constant amount. And that's really important because it means that if you knew the pressure and the volume of some gas at the beginning, and you knew the pressure or the volume at the end after you've maybe increased or decreased the volume, we can then work out the new pressure or volume. And effectively what we can say is that the pressure times the volume before is going to be equal to the pressure times the volume afterwards. And this is provided it happens at a constant temperature. And finally, if you have this gas and you do some work on it, perhaps you compress something, so you're applying a force over a distance, what happens is you then increase the internal energy, because you might be giving these things more kinetic energy, and if you give these things more kinetic energy or more potential energy, then what we're doing is we are increasing the internal energy of the particles in that system. So that is just a very quick summary of the AQA particle model. Just a little bit of revision, but if you'd like to find out more information, please have a look at my website, gcsephysicsonline.com. So everything is made out of atoms, and in the centre of an atom, what you have is this nucleus, which is made up of protons and also neutrons. And here I'm just using the yellow Lego to represent my proton. Now a proton has a charge of plus one, but a neutron has zero charge. And the size of this nucleus is actually really small. It's in the order of 1 times 10 to the minus 14 metres. But this is surrounded by these orbiting electrons. And these orbit around it in distinct shells. Now these electrons have a charge of minus 1. And also what they can do is they can jump from one shell to the next. And it might be that this atom absorbs some electromagnetic radiation, uh, the electron moves up at an energy level, and then it can drop down, releasing energy as well. So um, the kind of scale of the atom, the actual whole atom, is in the order of 1 times 10 to the minus 10 metres. So these are really, really small. Now when it comes to representing these, what we do is we have one or two letters which represent the chemical element, and then we've got a number at the bottom left. Now this number here is called the atomic number, and the atomic number is the total number of protons, and that's what defines the element. And then the number at the top is bigger, and that's the number of protons plus neutrons inside the, the atom. And this is known as the mass number. Now, when we have a standard atom, there's no overall charge. And the reason for this is that the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons. So the two charges balance each other out. 
Sometimes we have an ion, and this is something which is an atom which has an overall positive or negative charge, often when one of the electrons or a couple of the electrons either leaves the outer shell or a couple join it to fill up the outer shell, like you've probably learned about in chemistry. And in an ion, uh, the number of protons isn't equal to the number of electrons, and that means it'll be either positive or negative. There are also things which are called isotopes. So these are atoms of the same, em same element, but with a different number of neutrons. So that might be this thing up here. Maybe it's got an extra neutron. We still have the same number of protons, so it's still the same element, but now it's got a different mass number. And that's what's known as an isotope. Now, sometimes we have unstable isotopes. And if you have an unstable isotope, it tries to become more stable by giving out particles or something from the central nucleus of that atom. And there are a few different sorts of radiation. First of all, we have alpha radiation. This is made out of two protons and two neutrons. And that means it's relatively heavy and it's also very ionizing. Uh, it's got a charge of plus two because of these two protons. And when we talk about things which are being ionizing, effectively that means if they smack into another atom, they can knock off electrons and make the atom into an ion. Now that can be dangerous for people because that then changes the chemical properties and can cause mutations and cancer and so on. So first of all, alpha radiation emitted from the nucleus, very heavy and it's got a very short range. The next type is beta. And beta radiation is a high speed electron which is emitted from the nucleus of the atom. This has got a charge of minus one because it's an electron. And actually what's happening inside is that a neutron turns into a proton and an electron. So this is then emitted. It's quite ionizing still because it's got a charge of minus one. It's got a longer range than alpha, but it's not as dangerous because it's not got such a big charge. The third type is gamma radiation. Now this one here, isn't actually a particle, instead it's a burst of electromagnetic radiation. It's a wave and that means it's got no charge. Um, it is ionizing because this wave can still cause um, electrons to be uh, taken off another atom, but it's also got a really, really long range and it's really hard to stop gamma radiation. And occasionally, sometimes we also get neutrons which are emitted. And once again, the neutron, what it's going to do, it's just going to disappear from that nucleus. It goes flying off. And maybe some of the energy of this neutron could cause something else to become ionized. So neutrons, again, have no charge. That's a kind of sort of fairly rare kind of nuclear radiation. But what we can do is we can show these with some nuclear reactions, a bit like the way that we show chemical reactions. Now, the way that we show alpha in terms of this nuclear reaction is we maybe start with a radioactive isotope and what happens is it gives out an alpha particle. Now we give the alpha particle, uh, because it's the same as a helium nucleus, because it's got two protons and two neutrons, uh, we can often represent an alpha particle as uh, HE for helium 2, 4. Now what happens is that this number here, the atomic number, goes down by a factor of 2, because we've got rid of two protons, so it's Z minus 2, um, and the mass number goes down by 4, because it's got rid of two protons and two neutrons, so the number at the top goes down by a factor of four. And this then makes a new isotope. If we did the same and looked at beta, again, we might have an element uh, Z, uh, sorry, X. You know, this is just a made up thing. And what happens if it gives out uh, beta radiation, this is the same as an electron. And effectively an electron, we give it the number of zero and minus one. I'll talk about why that is in a second. Now this thing here might decay and it might make a different isotope Z. Now the mass number doesn't change because all that's happening inside is that a neutron turns to a proton, so it's still got the same mass in the middle. But because we now gain uh, one proton when there was a neutron before, that means the number at the bottom increases by one. And what we can see is that this number here and this number here add up to that number there. So what we're doing is we're conserving the atomic number and mass number in this reaction. So this is a way to represent beta emission. Now, when it comes to looking at radiation, there are two things we can think about. We've got activity, which is the amount of alpha or beta particles which um, is given out. So that's the amount given out per second. But what we then do is we actually count this using some kind of radiation detector, often a geiger muller tube. So count rate is the actual number of decays recorded each second by the detector, while activity is the total amount given out from that nucleus. And actually, the thing about radioactive decay is um, it's something which is spontaneous and random, and there's nothing that we can do to influence. But what we can do is we can look at the decay of something over a period of time. 
So maybe we have the activity or the number of nuclei up here and here we have time. And what we find is over time we get a graph that looks like this. And the important thing is that if we look at a certain amount of time and we look at the activity, after a certain amount of time the activity is going to decrease by half. After the same interval again, the activity decreases by a half. And again, after the same interval, it decreases by a half. And this time down here is what we call the half-life. And there are really two ways that we can define this. Either the time it takes for the number of nuclei of the isotope to half, or the time it takes for the count rate or activity in the sample to half, to a full half of its original level. So these are two definitions you need to know about. And effectively what this means is that um, it doesn't mean that after two half-lives everything is gone, it just halves and halves and halves and halves. And this line kind of never really gets to the bottom. And there are two further things we can think about, which are irradiation and contamination. Now, irradiation is basically you expose something to nuclear radiation, but that doesn't mean that thing then becomes radioactive. We can actually expose food to radiation to kill the nasty germs, but it doesn't make the food radioactive. However, contamination is when you actually get some of these radioactive particles mixed in with whatever the sample might be, and then that thing then continues to emit radiation and is contaminated. Now, we haven't always known about radiation and what it's like inside the atom. In fact, there are different models which we've, put, which we've actually used over time. Initially, they thought that all atoms were just these small, indivisible spheres, that we couldn't break them down any further. Then we went on to the idea that maybe when we've got these electrons, maybe we've got um, all of these electrons and protons all mixed up together. And this was known as a plum pudding model. But it was later on when they did an experiment where they had a sheet of gold foil and they fired alpha particles at this gold foil. And what they found was that most of the particles went straight through. So if most of the particles went straight through, that means most of the atom is empty. Now they also knew that these alpha particles were positive, and some of these positive particles actually bounced back. Now the only way that you can have a positive particle bounce back is if it bounces off something positive inside the atom. So this meant that we then knew that there is this dense positive core. And this then led onto the model where we have the dense positive core of an atom, and this is surrounded by mostly empty space and a sea of charged electrons all around it. And then later on they found that actually there were neutrons in the middle as well, and then since then we've looked at other models where we look at the waveform of these particles. All gets a little bit confusing. Now the thing is that we are constantly being exposed to radiation, and some of this is called background radiation, and this comes from a number of different places. So some of this is natural and we can't get away from it. We have cosmic rays, which are highly charged particles coming from space. There's also radioactive isotopes underground, which decay, um, and this gives us some radiation from the rocks beneath our feet. But we also have it from man-made things. Some of these are nuclear accidents in power stations. Some of it's from nuclear testing of atomic bombs, and also in medical uses. Now, the thing is with medical is that we can use it for a couple of things. Now we can use radioactive traces to actually find the cause of disease and illnesses. So you maybe inject a tracer, which is a gamma source, and then we can put a detector outside the person, and we can then use that to work out maybe where their blood is flowing. And you want to make sure that if you're using a medical tracer, we use something with a short half-life. On the other hand, you might be using something to treat things, so maybe we're trying to blast that uh, cancerous cells with a high source of highly ionising radiation like alpha particles, we can direct that at the cancerous cells in order to kill those. So we can use um, radioactive material both to kind of find things in the first place and also to treat things. Now the other thing that we can do with some isotopes is we can actually split them apart. And when we split them apart they release lots of energy, which in the end causes water to heat up, turn into steam, turn turbines and turn generators, which we can then use to make electricity. Now the way that we do this is with something called nuclear fission. So fission, with two S's, is when you split heavy things up. And we do that by firing a neutron at it. When the neutron then joins that nucleus, it becomes unstable. It splits into two uh, kind of big uh, other kind of daughter nuclei, and it also releases further neutrons. So what we're doing is we're basically taking something big, we fire a neutron at it, and then it splits apart and it releases more neutrons. Now this process is called nuclear fission. And if we could then capture another one of these uh, neutrons, 
in another, maybe uranium or plutonium nucleus, this would then cause another reaction and another and another. That's then called a chain reaction. Now this is a great way of generating electricity because there's no carbon dioxide which is emitted. One of the big problems is that these daughter products are then really radioactive and they've got a radioactive half-life which will, could last hundreds of thousands or even millions of years. There's also the issue that if there is a problem with this and we get a nuclear accident, it affects a lot of people like at Chernobyl and Fukushima. Another thing that we can do though is we can take really light things and this is when we join really light things together and this is nuclear fusion. So nuclear fusion, you might join two protons together and as you add protons together, we then end up by making helium. Now this is brilliant because there's no um, radioactive waste. The problem is that we can't actually use it on Earth at the moment to generate electricity, but nuclear fusion, when we join light things together to make heavier elements, is what happens in the sun and all of the stars and that's why they keep emitting light. So that's just a quick recap of atomic structure for AQA.